we're going to be looking at anthotype photography, which is a technique that uses plants to make photography chemicals to expose prints with. Um, so my training is in art photography. So I went to um, East Norfolk Sixth Form and did an A-level in photography and then went on to do a BA in photographic arts at the University of Westminster. So that's where my kind of technical um, training is. Um, but also in my arts practice, I incorporate textiles, um, some drawing. Um, I work with natural found materials um, and as you know, I'm sure that lots of you uh, have as well, I've been kind of reflecting around um, how I can make my, my life and what I do more sustainable and um, think about the environmental impact of, of how I live. And then that extends also to my own arts practice. Um, so I started researching um, Anthotype um, last year. And um, prior to that, I've been working a lot in cyanotypes, so blueprint photography. So I'm really kind of keen on those contact prints, you know, heritage, traditional photography techniques. And um, I came across this anthotype technique and um, I've just been itching to have a go at it. Um, so I've been experimenting lots more recently um, and it uses plants, um, the phot photosensitivity in plants to make um, a chemical, um, but just using purely natural um, materials. It's really, really simple. Um, so anthotype is great because it is one of the most um, environmentally safe techniques to use. Lots of photography techniques, traditional photography techniques use chemicals, as we know, and um, there's issues around, you know, you use water in photography to often, um, you know, wash out prints um, at the end and then, you know, chemicals are going into the water. And when you're using photography chemicals, obviously you have to dispose of them at, at some point, you know, sometimes they go off um, or you've, you know, mixed, it, mixed up chemicals and you have excess. Um, so this is a technique where, you know, those issues are eradicated. It's completely environmental, environmentally friendly and safe to use as well. And often you use materials which could be edible. Um, not that I'd recommend <laughs> making a print to eat, but it could be an ex a bit of an experiment there. Um, but it's all, you know, safe um, materials. So it's great on that front. Um, it's also really simple and um, simplicity is great. You know, it's non-technical, um, which is also really fantastic. So really accessible, really, really simple. Um, it doesn't use any kind of specialist equipment either, which is another great thing. So, you know, especially in the situation we're in right now, spending more time at home, um, you know, we're not always, even when, as lockdown is easing, we're not able to necessarily find all the kit we need for our arts practice. But this is a kind of a simple thing where you don't need um, specialist kit. So it sounds great and it sounds perfect. Um, so what could possibly be... Um, something negative about it. Well, um, something that um, could be a negative side to anthotype photography, um, although I'd question it, um, is the fact that it fades. Um, so there's no fixing as part of the process. And I'll show you, you know, more about the process, but there is no fixing as part of it. So um, often you, you know, you develop a print and then you put it in another chemical to fix it or you wash it or do something to it. Um, this technique doesn't fix, therefore, you know, it's not um, UV uh, protected, it, it will fade with time. But you know, that could open up ideas around um, ephemeral work and work that is transient. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be a negative. Um, but other than that, I don't think there are any sort of downsides to it. So um, how to get started? Basically, you'll need to find some sort of plant matter. So I would raid the kitchen, the garden, if you're out on a walk. So things that you might find in your kitchen for example, are um, turmeric powder. Um, so obviously we know if you, know, if you use, it, use it to cook um, curries, you'll know that it stains your fingers. So you're looking for things that you work with and you think, oh, that's gonna stain my fingers, I'll need to wear gloves or I'll need to be really careful of the surfaces. If you have something in your kitchen which is like that, it's probably good for anthotype. So to use it, I put it in some water, so here it is in a jar. So turmeric is good. Um, also paprika, anything that's kind of a, a colour um, spice. 
also you could use tea. Um, so I've used um, black tea, but I've also got lots of um, berry tea here. You can see um, lots of different berries there. When you add um, some water to that, you know, lots of lovely pinks and reds and purple colours going to come from that. So berry tea is good, as well as um, just, you know, your normal tea, which I've got there um, in a jar. Um, I really like pickled beetroot, <laughs> so I, when I've eaten um, the beetroot, I, um, yeah, something to use up the beetroot juice. So there we go, a big slosh of beetroot there, and that's all perfectly good to use, anthotype chemical. Um, things that you might find around your garden, lots of plants. Um, I've got some nasturtium flowers, which are soaking in water. Um, and you can see that it's quite sort of orangey, pinky maybe. Um, when I coated it on paper, it went a sort of greeny grey colour. So it's not always what you expect. So something's a bit different. And then just various plants that I keep in jars. And um, unfortunately, I don't label my jars, but I just have quite a good memory as to what they are. But um, sometimes I get a few surprises. Um, yeah, so things like beetroot. Um, spinach is very good as well. Um, if you blitz that up. Um, I've tried with dandelion flowers because I thought that um, dandelion would be good um, but it's quite pale but you know see how you get on. Things like berries, spices, teas, there are lots of things that you can find and use. And um, so I've got here there's a book um, which is a photography book called Experimental Photography, a handbook of techniques and um, you can see here there's a whole range of colours and at the present in the presentation at the end, I show a screenshot of this, um, so you don't need to um, worry too much. But on on this chart, they've got turmeric, um, red cabbage, um, madder root. If anyone's into their natural dyeing, so lots of different plant sources that can make a whole range of colours. So this just illustrates the kind of colours that you can get. So you'll need to find your plant matter, and the process of anthotype is really simple. So you need to blitz up or crush your plant material so you need to break it down and you need to break it down in um, maybe a little bit of liquid but we need to keep it really concentrate okay so in here I probably there's probably too, too much liquid in that really so I need to kind of uh, maybe boil it down a bit um, so yeah you need to crush or if you've got a pestle and mortar or if you've got one of those hand blenders that you could use a stick blender if not you can just chop and um, just really, really finely chop your plant matter. You then add a spoon of um, liquid. So you'd add it just a little bit of a at a time. So most often to, for anthotype, you'd use white vinegar, a couple of spoons of that, um, pure alcohol, or just tap water. And the thing about those three things, so white vinegar, alcohol and tap water is some of them will have an effect on plants and some of them won't. So the good thing about this um, beetroot um, liquid is obviously it's pickled, so it's already got the vinegar in it. Um, whereas with this um, uh, with the um, turmeric, I've just added water. So it could be an area to experiment. So if I look back on this chart, I can see that, um, you know, for example, something with um, alcohol in has got a different tone to something with white, so um, different tones to something when it's got vinegar. Um, so there's different things that you can add which act as a, as a preservative um, but will also affect the colour as well. So once you've got some blitzed up plant matter, um, whatever that is, or spices or tea, what you'll need to then do is strain it off so you've just got the liquid left. And that liquid will be your, um, your photography chemical. So you'd need to make sure that you're doing that in a, in a darkened space as well. So it doesn't have to be as dark as a dark room, but um, just um, you're not going to work in bright light because you don't want to be breaking down those, um, you know, the photosensitivity of the plant matter before you've even got a chance to print with it. So you've blitzed it up or you've crushed it, you've somehow made a kind of mush of that, that plant matter with a little bit of liquid in it, so it's quite concentrate, and then you strain it off. So you might have a, a strainer, a sieve at home, um, which you can use. You want quite a fine one if possible. Um, I got these coffee filters, so I thought, oh, that sounds really good. Um, and then they cost me a bit, and they were, they're sort of meant to be 
um, you know, compostable and very environmentally friendly. But to be honest, once I've used them, I probably won't use them again <laughs> because um, I find the best thing is just a scrap of um, cotton. So this is just off cuts of cotton fabric. Um, so that could be, you know, old pillowcases or bits and bobs that you can find at charity shops. I think charity shops are reopening now. So um, just off cuts of cotton, I find personally, they've been the best thing to kind of strain off that chemical. So you've crushed up your plant matter and you've strained it and then you hopefully should have something in the jam jar that looks a little bit like this so you'll have a liquid um, and then you'll need to in a darkened space but not as dark as a dark room just somewhere where there isn't direct light shining in um, you'll just need to coat it on a piece of paper so I keep stacks of different um, sort of cartridge paper watercolor paper that I just keep in um, A5 and A6 size as I find they're quite a good size just to make little samples so these are just sort of off cuts of bits and bobs um, of paper that I find and I just keep a stack of them um, available and you can brush them on using um, well I use these these brushes they're from specialist craft but to be honest it doesn't have to be a kind of special um, brush but I just invested in these um, a, a year or so ago because I thought they just looked really lovely and they work really well for me but you might have a foam brush and if you don't even have access to a brush you could just lay your chemical on some sort of flat surface maybe a plate and then just kind of lay your work in into the liquid and let it drip off so if you really don't have access to a brush um, there's always a way of coating and it can just be as simple as kind of laying the, um, the paper in the liquid and letting it drip off. So you'll need to wait for your um, piece of paper to completely dry um, as you're using it. So before you even use it. So I'm just going to just show you so you would just get your beetroot pickle juice or whatever it is and then you just coat it on and then you can see already you know you get this really vibrant colour. And what I tend to do is um, do this um, with my hair dryer. So I would do one layer like that, dry it up with a hair dryer, and then probably do another layer, and then maybe even another layer, just to build up, you know, a nice even colour. I probably wouldn't do it two more than sort of three times, just because it. So I find with them when you work with different photography chemicals, um, although this isn't a chemical as such, but I would imagine it'd work the same way. You can layer up so much that it almost starts to kind of then break down you add in another wet layer onto a, a kind of a crust of a layer and it can start to break down so probably two or three layers dried in between with a hair dryer is enough um, so you'll have something that looks a bit like that so once you've got um some papers i would use them on the day that i've coated them or it, if i was drying it with a hair dryer or I would let it dry overnight and then use it the following day. So I'd want to use it really nice and fresh. And if you're leaving it to dry somewhere, put it in a, in a darkened space. So I, I put mine in, in the cupboard under the stairs. I know there's no light going to go in there and um, I can keep it ready so that when it does touch light, you know, it's going to be when I, when I want it to and um, so I can kind of control it a little bit. So you'll have something like that in whatever colour. And, and then it's a case of um, just taking it really slow and being really, really patient, okay? Because you'll need to leave your prints outside for about a day at the shortest, uh, maybe even a few days. If you can go for a week, you could even try a month. Um, so for that reason, I tend to use in my little paper stack um, watercolour paper where possible, where I can get hold of it. Um, my supplies have run really low um, during this during this period, so I'm just using whatever paper I've got hold of. But my first preference would be um, watercolour paper if I could if I could get hold of it. So you need something nice and thick because you are going to leave it outside um, for a day, a week, a month. It's up to you. So to um, squish it all together, I use a picture frame. Um, so. In photography, you'd have um, contact frames, but basically that's basically what a picture frame is. Um, so you just sandwich the work in. So you can see the back, back frame there. It's got a sheet of glass on the front. Your picture frame might have a frame on it, or you might be able to sort of dismantle it like this. And then you just clip it together. 
And I tend to do prints of um, plant matter that I've pressed. So I've got a coated piece of paper. I lay a squished bit plant in it or something flat. I tend to go for plants because I quite like that. The fact that it's the chemicals made with plants and then print with a print of a plant. And then you just clip your frame together. And um, I've either used old frames or um, frames that I've got from um, charity shops really cheap. So you can often find frames in charity shops for, you know, 50p a pound. Um, really, really cheap. People get rid of them because they've, you know, got a frame on them that they don't like the style of. Well, all we're worried about for Amphitype, it doesn't matter about the frame. It's just that it's a piece of glass, a backing board and some way of squishing it together. So if it's one of these kind of clip frames, it'll have a clip like that. A traditional picture frame will grip together. If not, you can use um, sort of bulldog clips um, to clip it round, maybe um, elastic bands, if you've got those big elastic bands. Um, so it all gets sandwiched together like this. So this does a couple of things. Firstly, it lets the light in, it being glass. Um, it also has a slightly protective factor against the weather. Um, you know, the rain will run off it to a point. Um, and the fact that it's clipped together means that it's pressed really tight. And for these prints, if they're contact prints, type, that, that's the kind of type of area of photography, contact prints, where you put the subject pressed against the light sensitive paper to make a direct um, sort of silhouette type print. So really, really simple. And there'll be a, um, a slideshow at the end where I'll, I'll um, show you um, just the step by step in really, really clear, clear format and what you'll need as well. And you'll get sent that at the end as well. So great if you're making notes, but if you haven't been able to make notes, um, it'll come up. But just to show you some examples. So I'll just talk you through um, some of the things that I've been working on. So I'm not sure how much the camera's going to pick this up, but this kind of grey green. Um, was the nasturtium, which I didn't haven't done a print on, but it's I coated it up yesterday. So you can see like there's a real difference between um, you know the plant matter, and then when you coat it and dry it, even in that process, the colour can be really really different. Um, so there's always a kind of element of unexpected. This print um, was made using berry tea and a little bit of white vinegar and the leaf is a fern leaf and I've got it on here written on the back that it was printed in May for one week so that was one week in the sun and um, I sort of embrace if, if the rain was I can't remember if it was rainy on that week in May but the rain would affect it as well you know if it was rainy that week or that day um, but I sort of just embrace that but you can get these really lovely prints so what you can see from an amphitype print is that the, the plant or the subject is the brighter colour, so it's more purpley. And then what happens is the sun fades all the way around it. So it looks like a pale background with a stronger colour on the front. And that's the kind of effect you get with an amphitype print. And I'm not sure how well the colour's picking up on the camera, but hopefully, hopefully you can see there a print. So this is using the same thing as well. So berry tea and a little bit of white vinegar and this print is of um, pressed yarrow and I think I've got some here. Um, let's have a look. So yarrow which looks a bit like that, not that exact plant but you can see there. So you can see that the sun fades all the way around the edge apart from where the plant is blocking the light and then you get these kind of um, silhouettes. So I've also tried with things like I say um, this that was um, berry tea, whereas this was um, black tea. So you can see that actually the print was, um, this was out for one week, but it's very, very soft and subtle. And you can see there's a real, very poorly coated there, even if I do say so myself. So yes, I do um, press the flowers or the plants before, um, and I'll show you how I make a little simple flower press after I've shown you these. So turmeric was one that I mentioned, which is what lots of people have got in their kitchen, but it could be paprika, it could be other things that you think, oh no, that's going to stain my hand. So this is what turmeric looks like. So I really love this anthotype effect because you get a really bright colour of whatever the original um, solution was. 
and then all the way around it, around it fa uh, fades away. So it degrades in the UV, which is what we want. So this is of a fern leaf. Again, it was out for one week outside, you know, clipped, clipped up in a picture frame like that. It was outside for one week and then it came out like this. So you get a bright yellow with, with turmeric, which looks really, really nice, I think. Then I had to go at just comparing the colours. So this hasn't been exposed in the sun. This is just simply the colours, just to kind of compare, really. Um, so berry tea is the purple and then turmeric. Um, and your research might take you into sort of natural pigment making and natural dyeing. And I've got lots of resources here around that. And it might be a good sort of research avenue for you. Um, so I've got some different um, dyeing books and in different um, magazines, I've got some dyeing resources. Um, so there are different um, lovely sort of swatches and things. The thing, what I would say about the natural dyeing is that they're going to use a completely different process. So they're going to be um, looking at things like mordants, which fixes um, and kind of maintains the fabric and prepares the fabric. Um, whereas with our anchor type, what we want is to encourage that breaking down. So the kind of fixing process becomes slightly less important because we want, you know, we want that really lovely um, you know, fade of colour around the, around the outside. We don't want to fix the colour. We want it to break down. So we want that, you know, that lovely highlighted effect. So if you're looking into, um, if your research takes you from anthotype into um, natural dye, and just be aware that the process is, is quite different, but it might be a good um, source of inspiration to look at, you know, what plants do people use in, in, in natural dyeing? Is that something that's available to me? Could I copy it? But kind of change, change the process. So in natural dyeing books, you get all these lovely illustrations and um, swatches, but just be aware that the process is very, very different. So there's lots of different colours that you can get, and um, it kind of just depends on what you've got available at home, what you've got in your kitchen, what you've got in your garden. Um, different colours are going to have different outcomes, and um, they're not always what you expect. So if you're going to make your print, I'd leave it outside for at least one day, and then. Um, leave it out for um for one day as your minimum as your kind of test print and then if you're going to do like your final print i'd leave it out probably for a week just to get a really high contrast and i just saw a question pop up about what the dye book is and it's called dye plants and dyeing and it's by john and margaret cannon and i can send that through in an email afterwards um so yeah your research might take you down that route um, but just be aware that um, you know different different plants are going to react in different ways. And so I was saying that I I sandwich up my print and put them outside. So all you need is really direct sunlight. So if you left it on a sunny windowsill um, for a week, that might be great. Um, but obviously, if you've got access to the outside, then that would be brilliant, propped up somewhere safely. But a sunny windowsill, as long as there's direct light for you know, as, as long as possible during daylight hours, then you'll get a really strongly um, exposed print. So you can see from my um, samples here that I've got lots of different colours that I've been able to produce, um, sort of greys and browns, yellows, pinks um, and purples. Um, there's no, I can't sort of say to you, you know, you need X amount of mils of this or grams of this, because it all depends on how fresh the ingredients are, or how much extra liquid you're going to use, whether it's an addition of a little bit of water or alcohol or, or vinegar. Um, so it's one of those processes where it really is about doing it and trying it. Um, but if you're wanting to have a go and you're not really sure where to start, I would always recommend beetroot because you just get a lovely pink colour. And um, I think it's just a really good one to start with. And we all know if you've ever chopped beetroot um, that it just absolutely stains the hand. So that would be a great one. And turmeric. As, as well. So they would be the two that I would say, if you're, if you're a bit unsure, these would be the two to start with. So I'm going to just ask Gavin to switch over to the um, slideshow and then we, I can just go through the process. It'll be really kind of just lovely and short and sweet, hopefully, but if you've got any questions, I'm really happy to answer. 
um, and then we can have a little discussion. Um, any questions? So I can just see a question's come through. Is it possible to layer? Um, I would just say try it out, experiment and see what you find because I haven't layered the prints. That doesn't mean it doesn't work, but I would say experiment and see. Um, okay, so let's have a look at the um, look at the slideshow. And if you've got any questions at any point, um, then do just um, let me know and I'll do my best to answer. Um, but hopefully you can see the process is really simple and hopefully quite accessible as well. Um, okay, so let's have a look at this slideshow. Brilliant. So the history of amphotypes. So just to give you a little bit of um, context. Um, so you might have heard of uh, Sir John Herschel. So he also invented um, um, cyanotype, which is a technique that I work a lot in. Um, he also invented, he's said to invent um, amphotype, but also you can see a list of names there. Um, they're also credited with um, the discovery of amphotype. And for some Sometimes in history, and sometimes this is a factor that isn't always resigned to history, unfortunately, um, but there were different people um, and women who were um, part of the um, invention of these, you know, photosensitive early photography techniques, but unfortunately, because of who they were, um, their, their names aren't always credited um, with the invention of, of these different techniques. Um, so lots of people have been part of this process, but it's Sir John Herschel who who um, gets uh, his name um, down in history. Um, so yeah, yeah, next slide. Thank you very much. So um, you can see on the right there, there's an example of um, my lovely pink beetroot. I think that's um, a potato leaf. And um, you can see there the way that the paper has soaked up on the right there. Um, in different ways. So you get a kind of, a, depends on um, how thick your paper is, that wasn't watercolour paper. So you also get that texture as well as obviously getting the different um, textures from, from the print itself. So these are, this is what you'll need. So you'll need your plant matter. So I've just given you some examples of leaves, petals, weeds, fruit, veg, spices. It's just a case of, you know, raiding the cupboards, raiding the garden, if you're out on a walk and you see a lovely flower, maybe, you know, just maybe if you blitz it up, it could um, turn into something lovely. Um, I've only really used fresh materials. Um, so I don't, I don't have as much experience in using the kind of dried, um, le uh, dried leaves and petals. I tend to use fresh. So you'll also need something like a pestle and mortar or a blender to blitz it up. So if you haven't got that, just use whatever you can to get something chopped up. And then you can see on the list, it's a sieve or muslin, cotton, a coffee filter. So something to, to filter out the vegetably lumpy, whatever it is you've used in and just strain off that liquid. Then we use hopefully watercolor paper, but paper, you could use then a brush or something else to coat a picture frame to sandwich it all together. And just as part of the process, you'll probably need lots of um, jars and bowls, and then something to print. So pressed flowers I tend to use. Um, you can make a really, really simple um, flower press just by using squares of, um, squares of cardboard, and you layer up the plants in between, and bind it up with um, a piece of, um, maybe string or uh, elastic band and you'll get a really simple flower press there. Um, and so don't, don't worry if you can't catch all this because th there will be um, the presentation and all the rest of the information will be sent out afterwards. So um, if you haven't made notes on this, don't worry. Um, so if you swap to the next slide, please. So really, really simple. So number one, choose a plant or something that's got lots of natural colour in it, something that you cook with that you that always stains your finger, something that you can spot out in your garden or on a walk that looks really colourful, something that you know has already naturally got pigment in it and you blend it up. Then you strain that plant pulp, use the liquid to coat your paper, expose it for as long as you can, 
start with a day, then see what, you know, three days looks like, see what a week like, looks like, and then reveal. So as I said at the beginning, there's no fixing process to this, okay? So you don't wash the paper after. It's when it comes out of that picture frame, it's ready and it's done. Um, yeah. Is there another slide? There we go. That was it. So the last one is this, this solution of, of um, the process, basically. So it's plant matter plus a little bit of liquid. So that could be water, it could be vinegar, it could be alcohol, and that makes your anthotype solution. So really, really simple um, process. And that is all it is. So if you compare that to other um, photography techniques where you need, you know, a stop and a fix, and how are you going to, um, uh, how are you going to, like, use those chemicals how are you going to use them safely how are you going to dispose of them there's lots of different um factors to add in but whereas you look at this you know it's just your plant matter a little bit of liquid and that is your anthotype solution once it's been um strained and then the last slide is just the book um the photography book that i was showing you just to give you an idea of the colours. So really like lovely, lovely range here that you can get. So some of the colours change when you add, you know, water or you add alcohol or um, sometimes what I've done before is I've, um, I've been sort of unhappy with um, the strength of the colour. So I've boiled them up, them up to get a really, really strong colour. Um, so you can do that. Or if you accidentally added too much water um, to your mix, um, and you strained it off and you were quite unhappy with how pale it was, then you could try and um, boiling it up and obviously, you know, be, be safe whilst you're, um, whilst you're doing that. Um, so yeah, someone's asked about coffee. Um, I haven't tried coffee, so I'd just say give it a go. I can't see why it wouldn't um, be a problem. So I think it would, it would probably be fine and you could probably get some really lovely um brown tones with that and i would say just give it a go so it's basically any plant root vegetable spice tea coffee whatever <laughs> fruit berries that you think has got color in them just give it a go it's such a simple process you just need to blitz it up strain off the liquid use that liquid leave it in the sun for a bit and then see how you get on um, so has anyone got any other questions um so i can see some um questions coming in so i'll just i'll just read from that um because that was the end of the the slideshows there so if anyone missed that um they will be um emailed afterwards um so I've, someone's asked about using clear plastic or, or acrylic instead of glass um yes that would be fine um as long as the light can penetrate it um, someone's asked, um, what are the active ingredient that makes it work? Um, well, plants have photosensitivity in them. Um, so basically you're kind of exploiting that photosensitivity and you're um, breaking down um, the, um, the sort of the matter of the plant in the UV light and that's what we, makes it work. The title of the experimental photography book was Experimental Photography, a Handbook of Techniques, and it's published by Thames and Hudson. As I say, I'm gonna, I'll email out the resources that I've used. Um, can you stop it from fading after you have exposed or revealed it? So the answer is no. Um, because there's no stop and fix process, no, you cannot. Um, you could put it in a, a slightly darkened space, like a sketchbook. Um, that would give it some UV protection in that it's not open to light. But no, as part of this process, it is a natural process where eventually the print will completely fade. Whether that takes weeks, months, years, um, it depends on the plant matter you've used. Um, but you cannot stop it from completely fading. That is an inevitable part of an ephemeral process. Someone's asked, does it work on fabric? Um, to do it on fabric is probably more aligned with natural dyeing or eco printing, so you'd have to um, experiment. Someone's asked if you can combine ingredients to make different colours. I'm sure you can if you mix up um, different things in different jars, um, and it will be just a case of um, trial and error. But yeah, you can definitely mix up colours. 
Um, so someone's asked, how long do they fade? Um, how long do they last before they fade completely? Um, and that completely depends on the plant matter being used. So, for example, um, some things fade a lot faster. Um, I've found that the turmeric is not very light fast. I've had to keep that um, really kind of hidden from light, whereas some things do last longer. I found the beetroot um, after like maybe two or three months has almost faded away. Um, each, each of the plant matters are, are different, um, so some things aren't very light fast at all. So someone's asked, is it possible to expose negatives onto the surface? So yes. So I use um, pressed flowers because that's what um, I'm interested in. So um, some pressed flowers that kind of works with my practice. But if you have anything that's um, flat, then yes, of course, and negatives would, would work. Um, can take a photo of it to keep? Yeah, that's a really good idea. So anything that I, that I produce, I tend to just put it through. I've got a scanner on my printer. So I just make a scan of it. Um, so that's a good way of keeping it and you've got a digital version of it. It's not quite the same, but it, I think this is just part of that ephemeral process is that you do get these prints that fade. And I think that um, I was having a conversation somewhere and, you know, they were sort of questioning, you know, is are things being permanent? Is that like the be all and end all? Does that kind of affect the value of things? And I think it's just a really interesting conversation about, um, you know, how we want to kind of keep on to things and keep things permanent. but for things to fade, just embrace that process and take a photo of it if you want it to stay the same. Um, how recent are the images that you've shown us? So the, Im the ones that I've shown you were produced during um, April and May. And I would say that the ones I've made in April are, there's some of them that are nearly sort of returned back to um, just a normal sheet of paper. They're so, so soft and pale because I've just left them out. Whereas the ones that I've kept face down, or if you've got a sketchbook, you know, equivalent, um, they've kept a lot, a lot better. But I've noticed that some of the, um, it's like the kind of tone, like the acidity of the tone maybe is kind of um, changed. But um, yeah, these are about a couple of months old, um, the, the little test prints that I've been, been showing up on the screen. Um, yeah, so do let me know if you have any more questions. Um, hopefully I've answered um, lots there. Um, and all of the resources and all of the things that I mentioned, including the video, is gonna go out um, again after the session as an email. So if you haven't managed to make notes, then hopefully um, if you want to follow back, um, that would be great. And so someone's just asked, do I reuse the paper? Um, yes, I definitely do, because I don't like wastage. Um, and someone's asked what my favorite thing or plant matter is to use. And I just say my trusty beetroot. I mean, I don't know whether it's just because I enjoy eating beetroot, <laughs> but I just think beetroot makes such a lovely pink color. Um, just, I think just beetroot is just a classic. So I'm sure you somehow you'll have access to beetroot. I'm sure most people can try <laughs> um, a bit of that, but I would say that's probably um, my favorite. Um, so yeah, if you've got any more questions, do keep them coming. Um, I'm happy to answer. And hopefully that gives you a good idea of just how um, simple the process is. So do I add anything to the beetroot? Um, this has already um, got vinegar in it, so whereas in some process you would um, add the vinegar in extra, this has already got the vinegar in it, um, so I would use it just as it is. If I was using maybe beetroot peel perhaps, or leftover scraps of beetroot, then I probably, um, it is quite a strong pigment anyway, so I'd, I'd just try it. Um, kind of a little bit of mix of both if you've got fresh beetroot maybe just try it straight you know strained as it is no extra and then if you've got the pickle obviously you'll use it with the vinegar um but yeah and someone just said it's the right week to experiment with the process with it being so much sun it's exactly right so this is like perfectly timed we've got all the weather organized a heat wave <laughs> so that you can um get outside um so yeah get do try and give it a go and see what you've got um, so do you have to put 
prepared paper into the frame in a dark room. So yeah, I would say until you're ready for the print to be exposed, do it in a in a dark room. And when I use the word dark room, I don't mean like a full, you know, photography set up with black and you know blackout curtains and all of that. Um, a dark room could be um, a room like under the cupboard, or if you've got um, you know maybe a bathroom or kitchen that doesn't have direct light. Basically, a room that doesn't have bright light going into it. So until you're ready for that print to be exposed and is all ready and is in its frame and in its final position. Try and keep it as darkened as possible just to stop the um, photosensitivity breaking down. And someone has asked, will it work if it's cloudy? So yeah, it will. It'll just take longer. So you want really nice direct print, um, direct sunlight to make the print. But if you don't have um, direct light, it will basically just be slower. Um, so yeah, it's just a matter of, with a lot of um, these kind of photography techniques, it's just a matter of adapting your um, timings around what your own setup is. Um, so yeah, thanks ever so much. That's been brilliant. Uh, thank you very much, Anabib. So I'm uh, just gonna run through uh, just a couple of things to tie everything up. But during that time, if you do have any uh, final questions, do put them into the chat box. Um, I know a few of you are probably asking about getting a, a recording of a session or even a copy of the presentation itself. So uh, with the recording, this will soon be uploaded to a YouTube channel and we'll be sending out uh, links to everyone who signed up for the session today. Uh, for the presentation itself or uh, anything around Genevieve and her work and other workshops, uh, if you see on the screen, uh, the email address to contact with all that information is arts at takeyourplace.ac.uk. Um, so anything to do with this workshop or even all the other workshops that we deliver, just send us an email and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Um, and we would love to see your work over the workshops that we've done and even in the previous ones that Genevieve has done. Uh, we've had uh, staff and students respond by sharing their work. So we're up on Twitter, we're on Instagram. So you see the tags and channels to mention below and it'd be really nice to see your work. And Genevieve, I know that you've, you're quite prolific on Twitter and Instagram as well. Yeah, I mean, it's lockdown. Um, that's where I'm busy in my time, <laughs> scrolling through Instagram. So it'd be really lovely. Um, if you can show what you've been up to, because it's always really nice um, taking these sessions, but it's great if people can experiment and see what colours they come up with. Um, you know, maybe start with a beetroot, start with a turmeric, and then see what else you've got. Um, but it'd be really nice to see, see people's work. Um, in answer to the question of what other workshops uh, we deliver, so, um, so we do a range uh, with guest artists like Genevieve, so we've done different fine art workshops, illustration, uh, but we've also been doing more media based, uh, where we've got a documentary filmmaking series and a couple of workshops on uh, game art design that looks at like game development and character design. Um, but if you want more information on those workshops, uh, again, just send us an email at arts at takeaplace.ac.uk. Brilliant. Um, someone's just asked what my Twitter is. So if you either look up my name or put, um, I think the handle is G Rudd Photo. Um, yeah, I think you'll probably be able to find it there. Um, and then all the links for Take Your Place are on the screen. Hopefully, if you can see the presentation. Um, yeah, so thank you ever so much. It would just be really lovely to see um, your experiments and, um, you know, and just embrace the um, ephemeral and slow nature of this process and, um, yeah, enjoy working in the sunshine. <laughs> okay, right, I think we'll wrap it up there. So thank you all for joining along and thank you, Genevieve, for another amazing workshop. Thank you. Thank you all and take care. Speak to you soon. Bye.